Hello and welcome, I'm Rhys Janot and you're watching Know Your Stuff. Today we'll be speaking with economist Pavlina Cherneva in a two-part discussion about modern monetary theory and its principal policy prescription, the job guarantee. Pavlina Cherneva, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So you uh, just about have a new book coming out called The Case for a Job Guarantee. We talked earlier about modern monetary theory and I would like to talk to you about policy prescription, the key policy prescription of uh, modern, monetary th modern monetary theory, the job guarantee. Um, what is the job guarantee and are there, ex are there historic examples or even current examples of this policy being used? The job guarantee is a public option for jobs. It's a program that funds a employment program that provides employment, basic employment opportunities, meaning at a basic level, living wage benefit package uh, to anyone who needs such work for whatever reason. It's federally funded, locally administered. We could talk about that. Uh, but it stems from modern monetary theory because, as we were discussing a moment ago, first, the currency is a public monopoly. Second, taxes function as a way of transferring resources to the public sector. And so we have a question of both providing the currency to the population, to everyone who needs it, sort of the prerogative of the public sector to provide it, but also to provide it in a way that fulfills some basic public service objective. So full employment and price stability is one that economists highlight of whatever persuasion they may be. And what we are saying is that that, that can be done through uh, the job guarantee program, that we can provide employment on demand and that would normally uh, be uh, a bigger task in a downturn. And then we will be able to kind of provide a stimulus, if you will, through the job, jobs program in a downturn. And in expansions, when private sector increases its employment, the program would naturally reduce its own expenditure and will be the counter cyclical stabilizer. So the basic premises are the following. The public sector has a responsibility to address unemployment and its fallout. The public sector with its power of spending has the responsibility to not just provide employment, but also that that is useful remunerative employment that provides value, um, social value, because it is a social program, it's not a private subsidy, and that it can do it in a way that provides stabilization to the economy without um, suffering unemployment. In other words, it's a replacement for this concept of the natural rate and especially the Nairo. And it's a, it's a structural policy. It, no doubt, like any other policy, is going to have some significant impacts on the labor market, um, not, not the least sort of the, the banishment of unemployment as a policy goal around which we you know, design fiscal or monetary policy. Uh, examples, the examples that you asked me, are the examples. So if you are asking me other examples of uh, jobs programs of the around, around the world, there are many. There are, and we've had long historical rich experience with small programs, big programs, uh, whether it is the New Deal from the United States, whether we are talking about um, labor targeting policies in Latin America, Large scale policies we have seen in uh, the Nordic countries. We have also one guarantee, uh, rural employment guarantee in India, that is contemporary and is very interesting to study. But we have not had a policy that is truly universal and permanent. And so that is the proposal here that we employ these policies, not just as crisis. Uh, resolution tools, but as, as, a, as a permanent feature. But I want to I wanna say something slightly different, that it's a job guarantee, and the history of government guarantees is long as well. We have all sorts of other government guarantees, whether it is guaranteed loans, guaranteed profits, guaranteed prices for various commodities, buffer stocks for wheat and for gold and for oil. And we have designed various policies to stabilize those prices, but we have not 
uh, considered the most important, uh, if you will, resource, uh, uh, and that would be working folks, working people who do not have a, a stable minimum wage, they don't have basic protections or the kind of um, guaranteed policy that many other, <laughs> if you will, commodities and other policies are, seem to be enjoying. It's truly a morally bankrupt paradigm. In your talks and in your book, you speak about uh, joblessness in terms of a pandemic. It's fitting considering uh, the time we're living in right now. Um, what are the costs of joblessness? And I don't just mean economic, but the human costs, both physically and psychologically. There are many, and there's a lot of research from the cognitive sciences, from psychology. Uh, but there is, within economics, there is also good research on the costs, the monetary costs of unemployment. And so whether that is some sort of uh, penalty in terms of lost income, whether it is scarring effects, whether it is uh, chances for reemployment, the research is there. But we don't seem to be incorporating the effect on those around us. There is good work on the cognitive and life chances effects on our children if we are unemployed, on our partners and spouses, on the communities, of course, that blight and um, malaise that communities experience because there's mass joblessness, the cognitive effects, the non-pecuniary, what we call you know non-pecuniary effects actually seem to dwarf, and there's some research on, on that as well, the monetary costs. So in terms of psychological distress, in terms of suicide, the, the relationship is positive and mortality as well. And it is strong in the sense that the impact lasts a very long time after a spell of unemployment. So if, uh, if we were incorporating all of those social costs, the first thing I think we will notice is that unemployment is a public health concern. It's not just when you have a pandemic, even in normal circumstances, the fact that we are okay with with millions of people out of work means that we are okay with having a, a sickness, if you will, disease that we refuse to cure and we have the cure for it. And that is simply providing a decent job, uh, a decent living, dignified pay and in decent conditions to those who need it. And so that is the job guarantee is, is rethinking this neglect that we have from unemployment and saying we are spending the resources uh, and we are inflicting you know, or we're allowing all this um, this pain to propagate through our community, and uh, we should be inoculating against it. So the job guarantee again is more of a preventative measure. That of course, if you lose your your job that you loved, it might not be a, a truly a replacement. But what if we provided a meaningful public service opportunity in the community that you would be willing to take and um, allow you to then transition to better employment opportunities um, as you fit, uh, see fit. There's still, there. obviously, the job guarantee, as with MMT, has a, faces opposition. Um, there's quite a bit of criticism. People, some people might say, oh, that sounds nice. How are we going to pay for it? But you've gone into some of that. Or uh, don't, they don't want to be forced into work. The government telling you what to do. How, do, how does a job guarantee deal with those kinds of criticisms? The first answer is that we're paying for it. We, we are already paying for unemployment. The costs are very large. If we were to fully maybe account for the monetary costs, it's, uh, uh, they're probably dwarf employing the unemployed. But as we just discussed, monetary costs are not the issue. It's the real cost, the neglect to our communities and society and people and their you know, next generation. So, so those, I would say, are unbearable costs. We do bear them, but at, at you know at great distress to our to our future and our, our communities. The second is you know how nice, but I don't want the government telling me what to do, and of course I don't want that either. Uh, the way that we propose the job guarantees is a voluntary uh, employment, and I I can appreciate people's misgivings about this because for such a long time we have had jobs programs that have been punitive, that have removed people's uh, unemployment insurance or basic um, uh, income support in exchange or unless and until they show up for work and some uh, other, you know, some uh, under duress, maybe they don't have transportation, the work is far away, etc. So I am uh, appreciative and very, I want to be very clear that this is not work fair. This is 
fair work. In other words, that our aspiration is to create public service on voluntary basis, to put our heads together and think about projects that we can create in within the community and provide local employment opportunities. So the way I have suggested this might work in the US, and I think it probably could, could work in other places, is to use what are the either the unemployment offices um, as as repo repositories of local community jobs where we will be soliciting proposals and projects from stakeholders and groups that are already doing that work. I mean, we are already having um, initiatives that try to deal with this neglect, with, whether it's homelessness, whether it is community blight, the work is there. And we have some institutions that we can empower. And if we were providing them with the resources to do more of what they already do, it will be a bottom up kind of proposal of projects where if you need to work and you show up at the unemployment office or you go on the website, there will be a local opportunity there, a list, if you will, of, of employment opportunities. And the idea here again is that unlike the private sector who looks at the candidate and scrutinizes them, whether they are suitable for some, you know, private sector job. In this particular case, we look at the, the person who has come in and we're trying to fit the job to their needs and their capacities and abilities. There's a lot that we can do and we sorely need to do. Environmental and conservation work is one. Uh, dealing with care work, I believe, is another. So we can start there and organize projects that deal with child care, elderly care, um, care for at-risk youth, uh, veterans, um, former inmates, rehabilitate the environment, but also involve those very same people in the, their own provisioning for what they need, if you will. It is kind of an empowering, I, I see it as an empowering institution where you participate in the design of the project in the community. So it's not a top-down uh, proposal. And I believe it will be strengthened if we incorporate participatory budgeting and various other uh, you know, participatory models of organization. Well, you mentioned uh, the environment. Um, how could the job guarantee and in, in more than uh, in many ways be a boon for the environment or supplement something like the Green New Deal? Well, in the United States, the job guarantee was called perhaps the most critical piece of the Green New Deal. And for several reasons. First, because it, the Green New Deal makes a promise and a commitment to those who may lose their jobs in the transition from fossil fuels to green technology. So there is a, a firm, uncompromising commitment that we will provide a decent uh, employment opportunity for you. The second thing is that um, it is a way, again, at the local level to mobilize resources and start doing some of this invisible environmental work that has to be done rain or shine. Now, the Green New Deal is an industrial policy. It is a big, bold, all hands on deck employment uh, initiative as well as an industrial policy. So there will be all manner of employment and uh, hiring uh, for that purpose um, should we start doing the work. So whether we're talking about engineers, highly skilled technicians, um, all of that. But the job guarantee is that option, that safety net that says if you are roused about or deckhands, etc., folks that are the first ones to lose their jobs, we will make sure that they will be a good, decent employment opportunity for you here. So it is that, that safety net that embeds, if you will, the social justice component in the Green New Deal, that we're not going to be creating just jobs for some folks that tend to do well in the labor market. We have, are making a promise that everyone has uh, a, a place in the, in the job guarantee and in the Green uh, New Deal. And I want to say also that it is at least in, in my conception, it has to be permanent because even if the Green New Deal has done its mission, and I hope <laughs> we get to that moment, even if we, um, if we retire the New Deal, the Green New Deal, we won't necessarily need to retire the job guarantee so long as the market mechanism, and hopefully it will be a, a more just economy, but so long as that economy has a heartbeat, and it keeps going through ups and downs and 
people's jobs are lost because of those ups and downs. We will need uh, a, a public option for jobs. Well, as probably some of the answer to this, we've already gone through in our uh, discussion on MMT, but um, it'd be interesting to know if the job guarantee could be implemented in any country, for example, here in Germany. I think that Germany probably is more capable of doing it than Italy or Spain, where youth unemployment is uh, in the double digits. And those countries have fewer fiscal resources because of, of the Eurozone, and they have greater economic problems. I think in either case, it's money well spent to pay for employment than pay for unemployment. So if the model is that we're just going to neglect you know, the destitution that comes with joblessness and we're going to try to hold the purse strings really tight, then, you know, then we're going to be reaping the costs of that down the line. Now, if you create employment, direct employment, I think that there may be some budgetary repercussions um, I, uh, for, for the Eurozone, but on net... Um, you have to crunch the numbers, but on net, um, you should be expected to see strong growth. Uh, at least we modeled the job guarantee in the United States using a pretty conventional but well, you know, well-performing macro model, and we see strong growth and uh, a boost to private sector employment as well. And also because of that um, kind of multiplier effect, and we make reasonably conservative assumptions. Um, the net budgetary impact is actually small uh, in terms of uh, GDP. So can Germany do it? Yes, the unemployment rate is very low and you have the resources. You also have institutional capacity. I think this is what's, what's important, institutional capacity. Do we have the institutions or do we have to start from scratch? Countries that have been under neoliberal assault and have um, sort of lost a lot of their public sector um, uh, organizations, they will need to do some rehabilitation there as well. I mean, we have public works in the U.S., but they're underfunded, they're understaffed, and we, we will need to do a lot of institution building. But what we know from experience, even in the most distressed times, job programs can be up and running on very short order, and they can do quite a lot of good um, right away, whether that's the New Deal or uh, the program that I studied in, in Argentina, the Plan Hefes program, which which was very large and um, mimicked very much this bottom-up model that I'm discussing. So lastly, what political obstacles does the job guarantee face? I mean, probably some of them are quite obvious. And if people are convinced of its virtues, how can they fight for it? Well, the political obstacles will always be captains of industry. Um, but listen, captains of industry fought everything from the minimum wage to the eight hour, you know, working day, you know, from women in the workplace. I mean, if that's really like what we should be concerned, I, you know, I've read Kaleski too. He's, you know, he's an inspiration to me, but I am uh, not so comfortable with this kind of surrender that a lot of people, uh, you know, uh, seem to embrace because of Kaleski. And you got to read Kaleski because he tells you that public employment is actually the solution. Um, so, so I think that there will be obstacles. I think ideology, the, the power of the idea that unemployment is natural to me is the most significant obstacle at this point. Um, because it, it is not just economists that are talking about it, but if folks believe that it is an ine inevitable outcome and situation, then it will be much more difficult to proceed. But we we don't really talk about you know the inevitability of illiteracy right we say look people should be literate and we should do all we can to provide guarantee education so i i am hoping that we can come to an understanding that you know if folks want to work in a meaningful you know living wage job we should be able to design that policy so uh, ideology for sure and captains of industry but i think emancipation the mind and also rejecting this idea that there is nothing we can do about unemployment would be one way to fight about it. Um, another, you know, another way, of course, is to uh, call your representative. I mean, that's how things, how change happens. You know, a, an idea strikes a community. It, it, 
It takes the community by fire and uh, change happens. We have started serving this. Well, we have been serving this idea for a very long time, but recently because it resurfaced, there are newer surveys. And historically, this idea has polled upwards of 60%. But in the last crises, it has gone up upwards of 70%. And in the US, in very deeply conservative states, you know, jobs are not like a partisan issue. Um, the UK also ran a survey recently, also upwards of 70%. So I think, uh, you know, it's it's about carrying the conversation and coalition building. And the more we understand how connected we are through our various struggles, um, I think that the, the better the chances to work for homes guarantee, for universal child care, for jobs guarantee, they are all essentially the same battle. So when can we expect your book um, to come out? The book will be released in the UK on June 6th and in the United States on June 26th. And it's called again? It is called The Case for a Job Guarantee. Pavlina Cheneva, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And thank you for watching. If you'd like to watch part one of our conversation with Pavlina Cheneva, you can find the link in the description below. Please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click on the bell if you'd like to receive notification when we release new material. And if you like what you just saw and would like to support us in our work, you can do so by way of donation. All the information on how to donate can be found at activism.org. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.